considerations of the economic and environmental benefits of local ownership of decentralized renewable energy. He hosts the Local Energy Rules podcast, discussing monopoly power, energy democracy, and how communities can take charge to transform the energy system. He frequently discusses the ownership and scale of the energy system on Twitter, where you can follow him. Um, and my colleague, Yanni, will put that in the chat. So welcome, John. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, so I uh, my goal today is to share about a particular project that we have at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance that is, we hope, very helpful for uh, help in advocacy around climate and clean energy, particularly around promoting what we call energy democracy, which is about communities having more say in their energy future, as well as having more equitable outcomes in the transition to clean energy. And my presentation is really about what's called our community power scorecard, because it is an annual tool that we use to measure state progress uh, on energy democracy and to prepare advocates to ask for more. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And I'll just start off by talking about why, why this matters. So on the next slide here is a picture of one of the things that we wanna see more of. We wanna see more rooftop solar. We want more people who are responding in the chat saying like, I'm excited when I get my utility bill because I see how low it is because I've got solar on my roof. And we want more people to be able to reduce their energy burdens. We want more people like this who are part of a community solar project who can go visit where their solar panels are that are producing electricity, even if they don't have a house with a sunny rooftop or even if they don't own the property where they live. Uh, and we want to protect people's access to the ballot and people's access to have choices about their future and protect that from utility companies that use their money uh, to hire lobbyists, to pay, uh, you know, to make contributions to candidates, uh, to get cozy uh, uh, relationships with regulators, to go to fancy venues with them. Uh, we want to make sure that people feel like their democracy is protected from their energy companies. And finally, we want less of this, less of people looking at their energy bill. Although I always laugh when I see people holding a paper bill because I was like, oh, I've switched to electronic billing like 10 years ago. I never see my bill on paper anymore. But at any rate, we want people to have less of that reaction to their energy bill to be uh, to set up a system in which folks uh, are, uh, everybody has access at an affordable rate uh, to have energy that is such a crucial portion of our lives. Um, and that nobody is getting shut off either that, that uh, utilities don't have the ability to shut off energy to anybody so that people can not only afford the energy, uh, but have access to it all of the time. Um, so I just wanted to pause for the quick, and I don't know if folks want to say in the chat or something, I'm just kind of curious, like how many people have heard of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance beforehand? Uh, you could say, yes, I have, or no, I haven't, or uh, what a weird long name for a nonprofit organization. Um, but uh, just kind of curious as we move forward here, uh, I will just say for what it's worth, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary last week. So we've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, in fact, one of the first reports that we published was called the dawning of solar cells in 1975. And it was about the first factory that was producing solar cells for use, uh, as we call it for terrestrial use, which is to say outside of the space program. Um, so it was uh, uh, something that we have believed in for a very long time. Um, so with that, I'll just talk about the scorecard. So this is um, taken from the website uh, or the webpage where the scorecard is published. It's an interactive map, which is to say you can mouse over it and it will show you the score for different states. Uh, it's out of 80 points in total. And you can see, I think the biggest takeaway here is not a lot of states get a very high score. In fact, mm -hmm. the only state that gets anything better than a C is Illinois. And a lot of states get an F. And that's because when we developed the scorecard, we were really intent on making sure that we were holding states to a high standard for having policies that allow communities to own, to produce and own the energy, uh, the clean energy that they want, uh, and that we hold investor-owned utilities accountable, like Pacific Gas and Electric uh, or Pepco or um, some of the uh, Exelon, some of the other large utilities that we make sure that the laws are structured in such a way so that customers don't have to pay utilities for their lobbying expenses or for their charitable contributions uh, or for their membership in trade associations like the American Gas Association, where they can go out and lobby um, against our interests. So all, our scorecard is pretty comprehensive. It encompasses both of those things. And you'll get to hear more about utility accountability from Patrick. So I'm not gonna talk more about it, but just to tee him up and say, I'm really excited to hear more from him and about the work that he's been doing on that. 
So the scorecard, um, like I said, covers a lot of policies and I'll go through all of them. Uh, but the nice thing is on the, on the page where we have the scorecard, if you want to know a particular state, how it's doing, you can search right there and just boil down to the scores that we give across all of these different categories. So we score states for net metering, for third party ownership of solar, for their interconnection policies, uh, how well they allow uh, uh, projects to connect to the grid, um, whether or not they allow community solar. Um, like I said, there's a lot of policies here. And the important part about it is that we're not only trying to give people a score to be able to say, okay, like how does New Jersey compare to Maryland, compare to Alabama? But also the idea behind our scorecard is how do we give people ideas for how do I improve my state and who does great stuff um, uh, that you could copy in your state if you want to figure out like who to learn from. So you can see like Michigan has a terrible score for net metering, but hey, Minnesota's got a great score. So how can Michigan learn from Minnesota, for example? Um, so one of the things that we also share is the detailed methodology. So PDF alert, you will have to look through the PDF of all of the different scoring categories if you want to see this. But we really try to boil down for each thing, how are we giving the scores, which is also meant to give you a sense of what is it about the different policies that are important. So this, for, this is an example from the methodology document for community solar, and it shows you we have like seven different things that we're thinking about when we evaluate a state's community solar policy. We're looking at whether or not it has one. We're looking about whether or not it has a cap on that program or whether or not it's open-ended. If it has a fair compensation rate so that people who are participating can actually reduce their energy bills and they're not just like paying extra for green energy. Does it have one bill as opposed to like one bill for community solar and another one to pay for your electricity from the utility? Does it have carve outs for low and moderate income folks? And does it allow, uh, does it set up a system in which folks like that don't have to have a credit check in order to uh, another hoop to jump through? Um, does it have other beneficial carve outs or incentives or other restrictive components? So we look at all of those things when we're trying to score this. I won't go through every policy and all the pieces of the methodology because I'll just trust that if you're really interested in that, you can go read about it on our website and find that information. But just wanted to let you know that we've put a lot of thought into this, talked with our allies who work on these policies in states, talked with folks who develop community solar projects, for example, like Cooperative Energy Futures, who does cooperatively owned community solar and asked them, what are the things that matter? What are the things that make this work uh, you know, in this policy? What are the things that actually turn out and allow these kinds of projects to happen? Um, so this is the website where that scorecard lives. Uh, we update it every year. And the idea again is to continue to improve and make sure that at any point, if someone is interested in doing advocacy in their state around clean energy policy, and they care about the way in which that clean energy policy or that clean energy is developed, like who can own it, who might benefit from it, you know, will it help folks in historically marginalized communities? Our scorecard is meant to do that. And it's not exhaustive. There are so many other great resources out there and we cite many of them and link to them in our scorecard. A lot of the scores for the different categories actually depend on research by other organizations, like for interconnection from the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, um, from Community Solar, from some of our allies at places like Solar United Neighbors. So it's a, it's a collective effort and we try to give credit to everybody who helped us develop this methodology and, and to link back to their research as well and to, to their resources so that you can really get a sense for where this all came from. So the community scorecard that we publish every year is kind of one research product and it's, you know, it's that you can look through and see the scores for, for this one particular place in time. You can look at the summary scores for a different state, but maybe you're wondering, okay, I'm in my state, I'm sitting down with my climate champions in the legislature and they're asking me, what should we work on this session? or you're in your own organization, you're doing your strategic planning, you're saying, hey, what is it that we most care about that we wanna see happen during this legislative session that would you know, help us reach our goals in terms of advancing towards equitable climate in our community? Um, this is our interactive map called the Community Power Map. It's a partner to the scorecard. So you'll see this map looks a lot like the one you saw before, because this just shows the composite community power score, but it also allows you to click on all of the different individual scores uh, all the different components of the score and see how your state stacks up. So if you're trying to figure out like, oh, does my state really good on community solar, for example, you can click that. And if I remember correctly, I think the next slide actually shows an example, hopefully, fingers crossed. No, but it doesn't. Okay. Anyway, that's fine. I'll just say uh, what, you'll, what you can do when you're looking at the map is you can pick any of those layers and look through them and see specifically. Um, the policies are put, put into kind of two different categories, and this is true both in the scorecard and in the map. 
Uh, one of the categories we call is building local power. And these are essentially what we see as policies that enable more energy democracy to happen. They enable more community ownership. They enable cities to have more authority and leverage in their relationships with utilities, even if they don't own their utilities. They allow people to buy power from someone other than the incumbent utility. And they also, uh, in the case of the gas ban preemption, which is uh, a negative score, uh, we score whether or not states are preempting city and local power over their energy system. So a lot of different components go into this. And the second set of policies that we have on the next slide are what we call policies uh, for fighting corporate control. So these are actually a, uh, probably a lot of what Patrick might talk about in terms of utility accountability. And it's the first actual national survey of states to look at where they stand on these policies of do they have policies in place that hold utilities accountable, that prevent consumers from being abused by utilities, that prevent their money from being used to lobby for things that they don't like, that make sure that the utilities plans for the electricity system are reviewed by public and have public oversight, that they have some sort of prevention for utility disconnection that protects people and allows them to have access to this essential public resource. Um, and also, uh, one of the things that we look at is something called right of first refusal, which I like to bring up every chance I can get, even though it's sort of very obscure, but it's a weird policy. And especially in a time when we talk a lot about having more capacity on the transmission system to build more clean energy, um, it's a very archaic policy that in about a dozen states allows the utility, no matter who builds a new transmission line, it allows the utility to own it and to capture the profit from it. And so there are, like I said, about 12 states, mostly in the Midwest, uh, that allow their utilities to basically, no matter who builds a transmission line, to own it themselves. And it really just decreases the competitive access to the grid and the ability for other companies to come in and build the infrastructure we need to get to our clean energy future. Anyway, sorry to go down that rabbit hole, but that's just one of the many policies that we look at and that we score as part of this in the kind of two-part thing, building local power, fighting corporate control. Oh, here's the slide I was thinking of. Yes, you can look at them individually. So let's say you're super curious, like, hey, does my state prevent utilities from recovering their lobbying costs for me as a consumer. So they go to the legislature, they spend money on hiring lobbyists. That lobbyist says, we want more profits for our investor-owned utility and for our shareholders. Do you have to pay for that? Well, I'm sorry to say that if you live in those states that are not shaded in like Oregon or Idaho or Georgia or Wisconsin, your utility does get to charge you for those costs, even if they are lobbying for things that you hate. So that's a great tool that you, or a great, great information to inform, maybe this is a policy that I wanna work on. Um, the next one, uh, the next slide here shows uh, for community solar, you can see about 20 states have policies for community solar uh, with varying levels of quality. Uh, some of the best programs are in Minnesota and in Maryland in terms of uh, both their access and equity uh, for low income folks, as well as the uh, uh, size and scale of the program. But there are also good programs in places like New York, Massachusetts, New Mexico, uh, you can get all, kind of drill down on any of these and get more information about where does your state stand. Uh, and again, this is available for all the policies that we have that are part of the scorecard. Um, yeah, so here's the community power map. We update it at least once a year when we do the scorecard, which is usually in the spring. Um, we really like it to be a tool that allows you to get uh, some better flavor for where your state stacks up to be able to pick through the different policies without having to read a huge long report. <laughs> Frankly, one of the reasons that we decided to release it in this format was I was like, I, we don't need another 50 page report that tells people how to work on clean energy policy, but we needed something that allows people to like skim at a high level if they want, or to dive in at a deep level uh, and get more information. So that's available for free on our website. Uh, and it, uh, you know, like I said before, it's the, uh, partnership with the scorecard. So my question for you and my invitation as we're going to do the breakout rooms is going to be this question of like, what is it that you need? So let's say you're from Maryland and you look at the score on the map and you're thinking, okay, we get a 45 out of 88. There's definitely some room for improvement. You go to the interactive map, you look at some of the layers and you're like, okay, so our problems are around utility accountability and our net metering policy or something like that. I'm just making that up by the way. I don't actually remember everything about Maryland's score. Um, but if you look on the next slide here, what we're thinking about at ILSR is how can we help you? How can we make it be easier, for example? Is it, do you need a Maryland specific scorecard where we put together a one or two pager that says like, hey, here's three things that Maryland could do to raise its score that would be really helpful. For example, to improve its community solar program, it could be expanded to cover all utilities, not just investor-owned utilities, and it could increase the low-income carve-out. Um, so 
one of the, our our goal has been to this is in a broad scope of things. ILSR, like you said, we've been around for 50 years. We have a pretty good sense of what are the policies that really help push the envelope forward on energy democracy. And we've been doing that work and, and pursuing our goals of thriving, equitable, clean energy communities for, for that long. But we need your feedback to understand, like, what is the tool that you need that would help the most in terms of going from, hey, I have a big understanding of where my state is on energy policy to I'm prepared to go talk to my legislator or I'm prepared to go into a strategic planning meeting in my organization and have a conversation about what policy we should work on this year. So with that, I'll just say thank you. Um, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, we have a great podcast at ILSR uh, called Local Energy Rules that I host. Uh, I've had some of our other speakers on it. Lucy has been on there. Patrick, one of these days we're going to do it because you're also doing amazing work in New York that I would like to talk about. Uh, we've got the scorecard. We've got other things on our website, uh, all freely available to help support you and your work. Uh, and we'd love to join you to talk more about how we could be helpful. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, yeah. And so, like I said, we're going to have time at the end um, after we each go through the pre these presentations where you can um, jump into a breakout room um, with John to talk more about um, some of the, those specifics in your state. Um, and I am going to take this opportunity to dive a little bit deeper onto one of those policies um, that John mentioned that is in that scorecard um, that 350 has been doing a little bit of work on. Um, and that is the ratepayer um, cost recovery, or we, we just refer to it typically as utility accountability. Um, but really what it's what it comes down to is, um, as, as John was saying, is not allowing utility companies to charge you through your utility bill for their lobbying and also for other political expenses. Um, and we put together a toolkit to help you work on passing legislation like this in your state. Um, last year, Connecticut, Colorado, and Maine all passed laws like this. Um, and this year, similar bills have been introduced in 11 states, um, although it's not looking like most of them are gonna pass, but we will come back um, in the following years. Um, and so this toolkit is really designed um, to help you kind of get grounded and you definitely reference um, a tool like, like the ILSR scorecard to really get clear on what the current situation is in your state. Um, it has information about a model bill that um, Solar United Neighbors and um, our partners at the Energy and Policy Institute um, put together um, so that you can just take this model policy, give it to a friendly legislator and work with them so it makes sense in your state. Um, and then like, some information about how to how to work with sponsors, how to have lobby meetings um, and yeah, and suggestions on public education and outreach. Um, so that's that's what I'll be. Um, I'll also have a breakout room later and happy to talk more about that. Um, and next slide um, just gives you a little bit more of like a case study. Um, we worked on this in Maryland with a lot of the folks on the call um, and we worked to get this bill introduced this session. And it did not pass, um, but we think that we put put together some really good infrastructure um, to come back again next year. Um, so we were able to build a really strong coalition. Um, we met with a lot of legislators, um, definitely increased public awareness um, about this issue, which a lot of people just don't know. Um, and yeah, we're definitely going to be coming back for it next year. So I will be talking more about that um, in my breakout session. And in now I want to make sure we keep moving with our wonderful guest speakers. So I'm going to pass it along to Patrick. Um, so Patrick Robbins is a researcher, analyst, and organizer who currently works full-time as the coordinator of the New York Energy Democracy Alliance. He's also a fellow at the Climate and Community Project, where he is spearheading a soon-to-be-released report on public-private partnerships in the electricity sector. Through his, oh, and also serves as chair of the Capital District Democratic Socialist of America's Public Power Committee. Through his professional and volunteer work, Patrick worked for four years to pass the Build Public Renewables Act, which passed in 2023, and is widely regarded as the most significant state-level Green New Deal policy victory in the U.S. Patrick was born and raised in Brooklyn. Welcome, Patrick. Uh, thank you so much, Taylor. You can tell this is uh, <clears throat> an old headshot because I still have hair. Um, anyway, um, I'm really, really grateful to be here with you all, and I want to talk specifically about the Build Public Renewables Act and both 
what it is and why we prioritized it in New York, but also the how. And for a group like this, the how I think is the most important part. Um, my intention with this session is to share more about our work in hopes that there are um, principles or models that can be applicable toward the struggle for public power wherever you happen to be. And so um, that's really how I'm approaching this and really looking forward to getting into that more in, in the breakouts. So the public power campaign in New York began in 2019. Um, comrades in New York City identified that the utilities and electric grid are a crucial site of struggle for transitioning away from the disastrous fossil fuel economy um, toward renewable energy. Any plan to decarbonize our energy system has to take the electric grid into account. Um, you know, the standard format for decarbonization is to make sure that, you know, we're first switching to renewable electricity in the generation grid and then, you know, use that electricity to power everything else. So um, we saw electricity as a crucial site of struggle. It's something that impacts everybody's lives. It's something where you often have targets that are governed at the state level, which can make moving those targets and isolating your opposition, you know, more possible than if you're trying to organize at the federal level. And it's something that really resonates with people. I mean, you, you know, I remember knocking on people's doors in Brooklyn being like, how do you feel about Con Ed? People were like, fuck Con Ed. You know, it's really, really easy because the utilities have been responsible for um, so much misery in people's lives. Um, you know, in 2019, when this began, the um the utility that was my utility con edison in brooklyn you know was responsible for rolling blackouts and so it was very very easy to canvas on and talk about how really devastating it can be for people um to lose to lose power and at the same time when we look at the generation side of things we want to move to renewable electricity but we also were mindful that replacing fossil capitalists with renewable capitalists wasn't going to get us where we needed to go either. Um, you know, at the time, a lot of us were paying very careful attention to the Bright Power um, organizing effort. This was a unionization effort uh, for Bright Power in Long Island, a solar company in Long Island, um, where they just, you know, fired everybody that was trying to organize. Um, and unfortunately, that's, I think, a not unusual approach to unionization that you see in um, in the renewable electricity sector. And so we wanted to um, articulate a different vision for the electricity sector that would speak to the generation side of things and the distribution side of things. And so <clears throat> if you can go to the next slide, please. And so our strategy was to build legislation and write legislation through a highly collaborative process um, that would unite a bunch of different interests to secure a political block that could, um, you know, secure whatever we were able to pass going forward. And that meant making sure that the legislation that we were passing um, benefited organized labor and benefited workers who are not currently part of any uh, labor formation. It means that the black and brown communities and disadvantaged communities that currently bear the worst brunt of the energy system that we have, um, you know, have to be at the table in writing the legislation and benefiting from the legislation. And um, really making sure that everybody who is impacted by this is able to, um, you know, is able to benefit and have those benefits articulated as part of a platform. And so <clears throat> when we looked at this, we ended up focusing more on generation than distribution um, as a way of sequencing our work. So um, when you look at the distribution grid, uh, at least when we were looking at the distribution grid, we originally had a bill that would uh, democratize and take into public control the wires and distribution lines across the state. And um, we ended up uh, consulting with lawyers and other organizers and um, calculating that we did not have enough power to move that forward at that time, um, taking the lines 
would be unconstitutional and sending things up to the Supreme Court would risk, um, it would have been really risky and it would have risked embedding a precedent that could have been the opposite of what we wanted. Um, and at the same time, there was pretty strong union opposition uh, to the idea of public distribution, which other folks might be able to speak to more specifically in Maine or California, um, because there was the perception that public power and public distribution would um, would undermine existing contracts. And so we were thinking, let's focus on generation and build out publicly owned renewable energy generation such that the political logic of the situation changes and people can see the benefits of public power in their day-to-day -day experience. And so we started working and engaging on um, a bill drafting process with that in mind, looking to the New York Power Authority. So in New York, we benefit from a pre-existing public power authority, the New York Power Authority that was established to manage New York's abundant hydropower resources back during the New Deal. And there are about 50 small towns across New York State that already own their distribution lines, and NIPA is the provider to all public entities, which means um, all of those small towns, um, the MTA, the trains in New York, all of the SUNYs and CUNYs, the public colleges. And when you look at it, NIPA power and places that are powered by NIPA's electricity, they have far and away the lowest bills of anywhere else in the state. So um, when you look at how NIPA finances its projects, it has some of the highest rated green bonds in the country. It is absolutely within NIPA's purview to be doing much more than it is doing currently. And so our bill expanded NIPA's uh, purview to include residential and commercial customers. So NIPA can sell to any load serving entity, which it couldn't before. Um, and it made NIPA the builder of not last resort, but the default builder if the state is not meeting its climate goals. So in other words, the state has to conduct an assessment of how on track we are to meet our legally binding climate goals, which is 70% renewable electricity by 2030, and then um, build enough capacity to make up the gap. And this approach to strategy meant um, thinking beyond the bill passage, you know, what's going to happen when this is implemented? How do we secure that political block going forward? It also took um, a mass organizing approach that I think was really, really necessary. You know, one of the things about electricity is that it is something that impacts everybody's lives, but it is considered too complicated or too technocratic for people to understand. And that perception really benefits and protects the utilities and the lobbyists who can say, well, you know, leave this to us. This is too complicated for you. And um, Leah Hendricks uh, writes about this. Um, uh, sorry, not Leah Hendricks. Leah Stokes writes about this um, very, very well um, in her books, Short Circuiting Policy. Um, but for a variety of reasons, we um, we took that approach of cultivating leadership at every step. Um, next slide, please. And so in 2020, um, we focused on popular education, meeting with different organizations, um, really taking a highly inclusive approach to bill drafting. So reaching out to organizations across the state to make sure that we were getting this right in terms of the bill language, um, push Buffalo and Buffalo, New York, um, uprose in Brooklyn, New York, you know, we brought many, many organizations to the table um, to look over the proposal that we had. And that not only made the bill stronger, but that was also another organizing opportunity. Um, 2021, we continued the pressure. Um, this uh, picture here is from an action where we shut down Lower Broadway right in front of the legislature. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about the position that the legislature was in at the time as well, because we really had to do in-depth analysis of existing targets and sort of the power elite of the state in order to make sure that this passed. Um, you know, we have a Democratic supermajority in the New York legislature, and that meant that they couldn't pass the buck in terms of blaming Republicans. Um, it meant that there was a higher level of accountability, at least from a narrative perspective. Um, and then, of course, in August 2021, uh, Governor Cuomo resigned and was replaced by Governor Hochul, um, which I think was probably 
the weakest the executive has been in a very, very long time. You know, Cuomo was an extremely ruthless and powerful governor. And so we saw an opportunity there to um, really push on the legislature because we knew that if the legislature was able to pass this, our calculus was that Hochul would not stand in our way. And so it did not pass in 2021, but comrades in the New York City DSA and Mid-Hudson Valley DSA um, ran uh, candidates to electoralize this issue. And uh, even primarying the bill's sponsor for sitting on the bill and not moving it fast enough. And um, this resulted not only in a um, a challenge to the bill sponsor that was within a razor thin margin, um, he ended up beating the challenger, but uh, did so with um, such a narrow margin that it was pretty clear that he could no longer stand in our way. And um, it also resulted in replacing assembly member Kevin Cahill with um, Sarah Hanna Shretha, the first socialist assembly member in upstate New York in a very, very long time. And so the entire legislature was on notice. And by the end of 2023, it was clear that some version of the bill was going to pass. Um, I want to talk as well about organized labor. Um, we had a harder time having conversations with trades um, in the initial years of the campaign um, because I think there was this perception that um, public ownership would jeopardize existing contracts. We had kind of a turning point when New York State United Teachers passed a resolution in favor of the bill. And so that meant that the statewide body, the statewide AFL-CIO, um, came to the table. And when we were negotiating with them and with central staff, we basically said to central staff, give organized labor whatever uh, whatever they want, um, not just because we think that that's the right thing to do, but as I mentioned, our political strategy depends on that and depends on changing this narrative of um, jobs versus the climate. So uh, the bill did pass in 2023. Um, if you go to the next slide, it passed in the budget uh, with gold standard labor provisions, um, bill discounts to disadvantaged communities, um, an accelerated timeline for peak power plant retirement. So NIPA owns 10 of the state's uh, what are called peak power um, gas fired power plants, um, all located in black and black, black and brown communities in New York City. So this is a longstanding environmental injustice that NIPA now legally has to correct. Um, I will say that there was not enough in the bill on democratization and process, and that means that the work just continues, and we have we have to keep the pressure up. Um, NIPA is putting together its implementation plan at the end of the year, so between now and the end of the year, um, we're going to keep up the pressure on the governor. I don't know if folks have been following it, but New York State is really not doing well in terms of its renewable generation. There are project cancellations right and left, and now that we have the BPRA on the books, we have an opportunity not only to address this really glaring problem, but do so in a way that builds out the public sector and builds out benefits for um, for workers, for disadvantaged communities, and, um, and for all of us. So uh, I would love to answer any questions that you all have in the breakouts, um, and specifically um, thinking through how some of the lessons here can be useful or replicable in your own work. Um, we have a call-in day uh, to the governor. We would love to have you join for that. Um, my contact information is on this slide. You can email me anytime if you have questions about the work that you're doing. and um, Or if you just want to talk about public power, it is my favorite thing to talk about. So I'm going to stop there and thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, and yeah, Yanni just dropped the the call to action to New York Governor Hochul. Um, so if you're a New, if you're a New Yorker, definitely um, definitely do that. Um, so now I am going to introduce our last speaker before we jump into breakouts. Um, so Lucy Hochschartner grew up on an educational farm in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York, and saw the climate crisis at every turn. Inspired to do something about it, she got her undergraduate degree in environmental studies and government. From there, she spent a couple years in youth climate organizing in Montana while training on an elite biathlon team and racing internationally for Team USA. And since then, she has moved to Maine, 
and been the deputy campaign manager for Pine Tree Power, which was the first statewide public power ballot initiative, um, which 350.org endorsed. So I got to work with Lucy a lot in the fall. Um, so welcome, Lucy. Thanks so much, Taylor. Great to see you all. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, as Taylor said, I've been kind of around the country and fell into utility issues, actually, just really uh, had no plan to work on these at all, other than being a young person who really cared about climate. And my senior year of college, I had a professor who he he wasn't even that old, but had kind of a crotchety mindset. And he'd be like, all these young people talking about the Green New Deal, but nobody's at the Public Service Commission. Like nobody's thinking about the utilities. And then I moved to Montana to ski race. Um, and it's a state that elects their, their Public Service Commission. And so my first job out of college was working on one of those races and sort of saw firsthand how crazy that was. Um, and really brought me to public utilities. That was why I moved to Maine and why I was so excited to work for Pine Tree Power. Um, because one of the, the crazy things to me, and I think for a lot of people to learn, is just to take a step back. I think Patrick did such a great job explaining what a utility is. Um, but I've talked to a lot of voters about utilities. A lot of folks think, like, because we call them public utilities, that they're publicly owned. But in fact, more than 70% of Americans are served by utilities that are owned by private corporations. So here's a little map. Um, you can see that actually a lot of area is served by rural cooperatives. That's kind of left over from a New Deal policy that helped rural areas uh, build cooperative power because corporations didn't find it profitable enough to, to build in those rural areas. The public utilities are often in uh, cities and then investor-owned utilities cover a huge portion of the country and, and the vast majority of customers. Um, you can go to the next slide. And why is that? This was another really fascinating thing for me to learn. So at the onset of electrification, you know, Thomas Edison has made a light bulb work. Everyone is sort of like, oh my goodness, we need to electrify our homes. This is the most exciting thing. And it was it was a bit of a free for all for a little bit. Everyone was building power lines and trying to electrify things, but pretty quickly didn't take too long to realize that the grid, that distribution network that Patrick was talking about, the poles and wires was what we'd call a natural monopoly. Doesn't make sense, as this picture shows, to have a bunch of competing sets of poles and wires. They're really expensive to build. And it just got too confusing. So at that point, it was sort of, you know, up to communities to decide what what grid, whose poles and wires are we going to use? And at that point, investor-owned utilities and public utilities, so utilities that were owned by big corporations, robber barons, wealthy folks versus utilities that were, were owned by the city or cooperatively, they were both common. Uh, but these investors were really powerful. They had a lot of money. They were the, the richest folks. And they lobbied for the system of regulation that stands today. Um, that's what we call regulatory capture. When this system that we have to regulate our utilities, these investor-owned utilities, like the public utilities commissions that are supposed to protect us, those bills that Taylor was talking about to make sure that we're not paying too much money, we're not paying for them to lobby against us. Um, unfortunately, those regulatory systems were actually set up for the, from the very beginning um, to not be on an equal playing field. It's sort of massive corporations versus the people. And the PUC's jobs are not actually, the regulators' jobs are not just to protect the people. It's to find a balance between the needs of these huge, huge corporations and the people. And unfortunately, that means that when you have one side that has a lot of money, and one side with a bunch of folks who don't have the time or money or energy to participate in these proceedings that we get really lopsided outcomes. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And in Maine, we felt that really, really deeply. Our investor and utility systems were completely failing Mainers. So a brief history in Maine was that our investor-owned utility in 2017 had over 100,000 billing mistakes. That might sound small if you're from a place like New York City, 
Maine has just over a million people. Um, this was over one in 10 Maine households, uh, Maine customers of these utilities. And people were not just, it was not just mistakes of, oh, you know, I, I missed $5 here or there. People were being charged thousands of dollars by their utility company uh, with no explanation given. After this, we had some of the worst customer satisfaction ratings in the country for years in a row. Uh, basically, since then, our, our two investor-owned utilities, Central Main Power and Versant Power, have been bottom of the barrel. We also have the most frequent outages of any state in the nation in 2022 and are always sort of at the bottom of those rankings. And then the, the piece that was really prevalent right leading up to our ballot initiative was that last year, 94,000 customers, again, more than one in 10 main households received a disconnection notice in the spring. So that doesn't mean that they actually have their power disconnected, um, but it does mean that they were behind enough on their bills that they got that notice and had to either uh, make a big payment, go on a payment plan, or have their power shut off. And yes, Taylor, this is a real license plate. It's my favorite license plate in all of Maine. Uh, it was one of our donors and volunteers. Um, people really hate CMP, Central Maine Power, our biggest investor and utility. I've never lived in a place like Maine. We would be canvassing and people would just walk around like cursing CMP uh, in a really unique way. Um, and even after all of that, the real frustration came from the fact that because these were investor owned utilities, they had the right to make a profit that is, you know, entrenched into our regulatory system that they're allowed to make a profit. Um, and so they still made $197 million in profit the year before we ran this ballot initiative. We can go to the next slide. So how did we actually get to this point of saying, you know what, we just need to get rid of these investors who own our utility company and replace it with a consumer owned utility. That's what Pine Tree Power was out to do, saying, you know, the reason we have all of these problems is that the people that own Central Main Power and the people that own Versant Power they don't live in Maine, they're not responsible to our communities, there's no democratic control, and they exist to make a profit. That's their bottom line always. It's not to serve customers, uh, it's not to help us meet our climate goals, it is simply to make a profit. And we had a kind of tangential route to get there. In 2019, the legislature tried to pass a bill to get a consumer-owned utility, put the people in charge of our power. Um, but that that failed, and instead they just ended up with a study bill. So the legislature passed a bill that said, you know, we can study the prospect of buying out our utility and, and replacing it with a consumer-owned utility. That study came out in 2020 and had things on both sides. It wasn't it didn't come out strongly in favor or against public power. Uh, but People came back in 2021, a huge grassroots effort um, passed to send Pine Tree Power, this utility takeover bill that said, we are going to kick out the shareholders, replace them with a democratically elected board, and have the power held by the customers of Maine. Um, that actually passed. It wasn't passed outright. It passed as a, uh, a legislative initiative that would have gone to approval to the voters, Unfortunately, it was vetoed by Maine's governor. Uh, she was staunchly opposed. And so what our power, the grassroots group that I worked for, it was a coalition, um, then gathered 80,000 signatures the next year, 2022, to put Pine Tree Power to a vote, this idea of a consumer-owned utility in 2023. And we can go to the next slide. So 2023, that's when I started working for our power. That was like heat of the campaign. We were trying to get voters. This was going to be on the statewide ballot. You know, more than more than 100,000 people voted. Uh, and we were trying to get the word out. Um, and our campaign was was really exciting. It was also really different than the utilities campaign. We were running a very grassroots campaign, as I hope these photos show. Uh, the top left is 350 out canvassing with us. Um, we had, you know, one of my favorites, this middle 
photo with the airplane. That was a video that some grandmas, they called themselves the the grannies, the climate grannies, asked me to come film. They made a skit about CMP taking money out of Maine. Uh, it was set to a song, Home on the Grid, like Home on the Range. Uh, it's really fantastic. We had a concert. We had, um, you know, house parties. Phil McKibben came and spoke at the big uh, UU church in Portland, our biggest city. So this was this was what we were doing. We were getting out in the community, having debates. We were calling folks. We were texting. We were um, having educational events, parties. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And for a little bit more on those tactics, just in terms of things that you might be thinking of with a ballot initiative, um, most electoral campaigns think about their strategy in terms of three parts, uh, field communications and finance. And so on the field side, I was overseeing a lot of that. We did our educational house parties. Uh, so those were volunteers bringing people into their homes to tell them about Pine Tree Power. We did mass peer-to-peer -peer texting. So we sent hundreds of thousands of texts asking people how they felt about Pine Tree Power so that we could follow up with them with further communications. Uh, we did deep canvassing, both door knocking and over the phone, um, really having longer conversations meant to, to do really intense persuasion work with folks, uh, house parties um, where, you know, they were a little bit less educational and more, more uh, in the concert variety, voter registration, things like that. And then our get, final get out the vote canvassing and phone making push where we were just trying to remind our, our supporters of when election day was. On the communication side, uh, we did in-person and televised debates, lots of them. Uh, it's probably one of the few times that public power has just been on the television. I debated the opposition. It was very scary, uh, but fun. We wrote op-eds and LTEs and had volunteers doing that, earned media. So we were working with the press all of the time. And then we had paid digital. So we were running uh, digital ads pretty extensively over streaming services, YouTube, Facebook, I'd just say on that front, a big notable absence for our campaign was we never got to have enough money to put ads up on television. And that was a huge difference between the kind of campaign we ran and the kind of campaign the utilities ran. Um, and then the last piece was finance. A huge part for us really was a grassroots campaign. We had over 2,000 small dollar donors, uh, email, text, digital ads, people were finding us all, all over the place and really were integral to this campaign. We had some major donors and then we had some, some national foundation grants, but that small dollar donor piece was really unique to our campaign. And we can go forward. In the end, unfortunately, the Pine Tree Power Ballot Initiative was defeated 70-30, uh, but I think that it's important to look past that. So this map that I sh uh, threw in here shows the results. The red is towns that opposed Pine Tree Power, but unfortunately what that masks is that some of these green towns on the coast that voted for Pine Tree Power are actually the places with the largest populations in Maine. So over 120,000 people voted for public power, which was pretty cool in Maine, including a majority where I live uh, in our largest city in Portland. And that's pretty meaningful considering that these kinds of public power ballot initiatives often fail even just at the municipal level. So the fact that we were able to win multiple municipalities while trying to spread ourselves thin and cover the whole state was pretty impressive and just goes to show how interested people were in public power and how willing folks were to consider and take this big jump uh, to something that, you know, I had a lot of conversations with voters. Sounds great at first, but once you hear $30 million worth of advertising against you, you can start to sound really scary. So we can go to the next slide. So my biggest takeaway from this, and I think something for anyone considering a public power or, or truly any utility related ballot initiative to consider, is that the opposition, in our case, very unique in a campaign. I had worked on candidate campaigns before, where often, you know, you're dealing with two people against each other. What's interesting about issue campaigns like public power 
is that it's between the people and giant corporations. And what's particularly interesting about public power campaigns is that it's people and customers versus their own utility that they do not have an option about whether they are a customer. So they are in fact funding the very opposition uh, that they are working toward. Uh, and what that means is that the opposition has essentially an unlimited bank account. Our opposition campaigns had front groups. They didn't call themselves central main power. They didn't call themselves percent power. They had nice names like main affordable energy and main energy progress. But the only donors uh, for the vast majority of the campaign were the parent companies of our utilities. And they outspent our grassroots campaign more than 30 to 1. And they spent almost $40 million over the course of this election, which is just far, far more than you're ever thinking in a statewide race, uh, you know, between between two candidates where you have um, where you have contribution limits, to be frank. You know, people will talk about the spending differential between a candidate and they'll say, oh, my goodness, how did they win? They were outspent two to one. Uh, so 30 to one is just a conception that we aren't aren't really used to thinking about in campaigns. Um, it is pretty unique to this kind of utility work. Um, what that allowed them to do was have far more advertising than we did uh, on TV and on digital. And the messages that we found were most effective that I think any any folks should think about how to neutralize uh, were, were that it would be too expensive, too risky, that there wasn't really a plan, the sort of classic climate message of if we just slow down, if, if we spread some doubt, um, and then this idea that their power was going to be controlled by politicians. So you can see that all of those messages were very fear-based. The thing about a ballot initiative is that we needed a yes vote. Uh, and the easiest way to get people away from a yes is to spread doubt and fear. Um, because again, rather than in a candidate race where you kind of have to make a choice, a lot of people in a ballot initiative think of a no as just the status quo. So it's sort of like if you're unsure, often in a ballot initiative, you'll vote no. Um, and so ballot initiatives are a strategy that in the end allowed the utilities to use their biggest advantage to a great effect, their money. The larger the scale of these ballot initiatives as well, the higher the barrier of entry. So had we just been working in Portland, even if we had been outspent 30 to 1, we might have been able to talk to every voter with the million dollars that we had. However, on a statewide race, we would have needed $400,000 just to, to you know, do the bare minimum television advertising. And we never had that kind of money uh, to be able to, to put toward those television ads. And so my biggest takeaway for anyone thinking about working on a ballot initiative is just before you put anything on the ballot, I think we have a way of getting really excited saying, oh my goodness, we can gather all these signatures. We know how to do that. We have the volunteers, um, but we don't have a plan to fund it afterward. And that was the big, uh, the big question with Pine Tree Power that we never got answered. With that said, we can go to the next slide. We still had a really big win, which was that we advanced this conversation. The cool thing about being a statewide ballot initiative is that it was the first of its kind. Mainers now know more about utilities than probably any, uh, any electorate in the country. And we gained a lot of attention that I'm hoping will help you all in your campaigns. And so we did a lot of work with reporters, with funders to educate them about what this really means. We were on a, a More Perfect Union video that was watched, you know, 300,000 times. Bernie was doing videos with us. We were in the Washington Post. We were in Grist uh, and really just raising the awareness of all of the bad things utilities can do. And so... That's something that I'm still really motivated to stop. And in, in my breakout, one of the things that I'll be chatting with folks about is how to actually pick a strategy and a theory of change. And what are the questions you should ask yourself if you want something like a public power utility or just really anything from your utility that's hard to win? How do you choose the strategy that will best neutralize their strengths um, and take advantage of yours? Yeah. Thanks so much.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Lucy. All right. So now we are going to jump into breakouts. And um, so those, and you'll, you'll choose whichever one, whichever room you want to go into. Um, so just as a refresher, John's going to talk, um, you know, ha has that scorecard, can talk more about supporting state level advocacy, hearing from you about what would be helpful in your state. Um, I can share more about our toolkit to help you pass utility accountability legislation in your state or just, you know, talk through strategy on, you know, if that's something you want to work on. Um, Patrick is going to help think help you think through how to identify your targets if you want to work on um, a campaign in your state. And then Lucy will help I help you identify the type of campaign that's right for you. Um, so we will pull up those breakouts and just encourage folks to identify someone who is willing to report back to the group, maybe hopefully not your facilitator. So we get to hear a little bit more from some other folks. Um, and yeah, we will have, um, we'll have 30 minutes um, for these, for these breakouts. So you can get into the, into the weeds and have some, have some good conversations and hopefully some, get some ideas on how you might take some of these lessons learned into organizing in your area.